we always said he's one in a million, even as an infant. <laughs> we said our Jamie is one in a million, but it turns out he's one in maybe 35 million. This is Christopher Gala speaking about her son, Jameson. Jameson has Dirk one a or DYRK1A-related syndrome, one of many rare genetic conditions linked to autism. There are only about 250 people with the condition in the world, in part because historically it has been difficult to diagnose. The signs can point to many possible conditions, and the genetic testing required to confirm a diagnosis can be expensive and often inaccessible. For some families, getting a diagnosis takes decades. You know, we knew there was an issue from birth. Up to the day he was born, I was told that this was a perfectly healthy pregnancy, but when he came out, he stopped breathing, and he was considerably smaller than they had expected. He was in the NICU for 28 days. So at that point, you know, we just, we dealt with it day by day. You're listening to Spectrum Stories, the podcast from Spectrum, the leading source for news and expert opinion on autism research. I'm Caitlin Swaljay. In this episode, we'll discuss rare genetic conditions linked to autism and how the power of social media is expediting diagnoses and leading researchers to new discoveries. You can't diagnose intellectual disability or even autism one year of age, right? But you can start to look at developmental delay because, you know, they're supposed to sit up at, you know, six months or, you know, head up at three months, sit up at six months, walk at one year, you know, a certain number of words by 18 months. You know, these are checklists that every pediatrician, you know, kind of agrees on. This is Gavin Rumbaugh, a neuroscientist based at the Scripps Research Institute in Florida. His work focuses on neurodevelopmental risk factors. And if it's every milestone seems to be delayed, the very first diagnosis you'll get would be, you know, global developmental delay. So it's a delay in, in every, you know, in all domains of a child. But this isn't the final diagnosis for children like Jameson. It's just the first clue that there might be something genetic underlying his problems. And around three and a half, he was diagnosed with autism. So we thought, okay, this is autism. But then there were so many other things. He had so many other diagnoses. Jameson struggled with feeding as an infant and later with forming words. He had microcephaly or a small head circumference as well as seizures. And I knew there was something that would connect all of them. For years, Krista would research and bring in possible diagnoses to present to her geneticist. Inevitably, the diagnosis wasn't a fit, and so this cycle would repeat. Research, test, research, test. I kept bringing things to her, like, could it be Williams syndrome, or could it be Angelman syndrome? And she would test for them, but she kept saying, you know, that doesn't include the autism, or that doesn't have anything to do with this microcephaly that doesn't explain the one part. There was always one part missing. This back and forth between Krista and her geneticist continued for six years, until one day, scrolling through her Facebook news feed, Krista found something. And I saw a picture of a little boy, about one year old, on one of the microcephaly pages. And the mom asked, when you look at this boy, do you see anything genetic that you can maybe share with me. He looked exactly like my son did at about that age. He had a long, thin face, low, large, low set, large ears, and deep set eyes that were somewhat small. His whole shape of his face was just like my boys. Uh, They could have been brothers. So I posted a picture of my son and I said, this, I don't know the genetic cause of my child's issues either, but he, your son looks like my son. And um, a day or two later, one of the moms, she responded to my picture of my son saying, I don't know for sure. And I don't want to step on any toes or make you uncomfortable. But I think that your son is one of ours. And she gave me the diagnosis DYRK1A. You know, it's kind of linked to her Facebook page. And when I clicked on it and looked at the pictures of these kids, I just started crying because I knew immediately that this is what it was. A mutation in the Dirk 1A gene explained Jameson's low birth weight and his trouble feeding as an infant, as well as his microcephaly and his epilepsy. Every single trait fit. 
and also reading through the, the symptoms that their children have. Everything, he checked off every box. It explained all of those things that our geneticist um, was looking for. There wasn't one that was missing. After Krista presented the photographs of other Dirk 1A children to her geneticist, they decided together to run the test for Dirk 1A. She called me and just laughing and was amazed. She said, you're the first one. You're the first parent who diagnosed their kid before I did. Do I think that social media has changed the field of, of, of rare neurodevelopmental disorders? And I'd say that uh, it's completely changed the game. Uh, in my opinion, it's, it's sometimes things happen in, uh, coincidentally in parallel uh, to change the course of, of fields. And, and I think the rise of, of, of cheap uh, genome sequencing happened at the same time uh, as the rise of, of social media. Social media and cheap sequencing have changed the game for many people with rare genetic diseases. Many families turn to Facebook and other platforms to share stories, learn from one another, organize and advocate for their loved ones. And now I know um, my son is not an anomaly. <laughs> he, we always said he had the Jamie syndrome. And now he had people. He had, he had other people like him. And I had other parents who got what we were going through. Because when I talk to autism moms, they have autism to talk about. And when you talk to the microcephaly parents, they have microcephaly to talk about. I had so many different such a range of diagnoses and symptoms that nobody really got me or us. When you're undiagnosed, you know, the commonality that you have with other families who are undiagnosed is just the undiagnosed piece and all the other signs and symptoms that you're experiencing is different. This is Amy Clugston. She's the mother who first saw Krista's photograph of Jameson on Facebook. Amy's daughter, Lorna, also has Dirk 1A-related syndrome, a diagnosis that took them 10 years to get. It's, a, it's an amazing feeling. And then the other piece to that is being able to do something, try to be, um, get involved and make movement. These Facebook groups give parents and family members a community. Having so many people with the same rare condition in the same place also offer scientists ready-made cohorts for conducting research. Remba studies a gene called SYNGAP1. Like Dirk 1A, mutations in SYNGAP1 cause a syndrome linked to autism. Although these syndromes have different underlying mechanisms, affected families share the same struggle to find the right diagnosis. Back in 2012, Remba published a paper describing the neurobiology of individuals with SYNGAP1 mutations. A mother of one of the dozen people diagnosed at that point, she found the article and called him. She asked if he would be interested in helping support a foundation on SYNGAP1 disorders. And, you know, I was a pretty young researcher at the time. I only had my lab for a few years. And, you know, I couldn't imagine that, you know, my work would have any kind of impact like that. So, of course, I said yes. Rumba, together with SYNGAP1 parents, then organized the first meetup of SYNGAP1 families and researchers. I invited, you know, 20 scientists from around the world, and then the parent uh, Facebook network was, was able to recruit, uh, you know, more than a dozen families uh, in SYNGAP1 kids that also came to this meeting. SYNGAP1 researchers attended, as well as experts studying genes related to SYNGAP1, including those involved in Fragile X, Rett syndrome, and tuberous sclerosis. For all the scientists, this meeting was a chance to get out of the lab, and interact directly with the people at the heart of their research. And pretty quickly, it led to new discoveries. The parents started to talk to each other and started to discover uh, common abnormalities uh, in their children that were uh, unexpected and not really written about in the literature. What the parents would describe is their children's very, very high pain thresholds. So for instance, I would get anecdotal uh, stories of, of, of fingers being uh, uh, you know, crushed inside of a car door and, you know, a normal response would be crying and, you know, and, but uh, basically no response in Syngap kids. Or I got stories of kids falling out of trees uh, and, you know, breaking, breaking their arm and, and basically not, you know, not saying that there was anything wrong. Uh, or uh, jumping in, you know, getting into baths with uh, scalding hot water. Uh, and conversely, jumping into ice cold water and swimming for so long 
uh, in cold water where they, you know, they almost get hypothermia. And even parents that didn't raise this concern, I would ask them and they say, oh, yeah, yeah, they have that. Soon after the meeting, Ramba and his team took these stories into the lab and started to investigate. So uh, what we started to think of was there's some problem with the way that their body processed touch uh, and, and, and normal, normal touch-related processing as well as uh, painful touch. And sure enough, uh, we, we found that there was a nearly universal uh, that, that, that parents would complain, would, would say that their child had a high sensory threshold or a high pain threshold and would describe these near universal uh, abnormalities uh, to, to pain and touch. So what we did is we took that data, that clinical data, and then we went and, and modeled this uh, in animals that had similar types of variants uh, to be able to see if there was some biological mechanism that linked Syngap-1 dysfunction to altered processing of touch and pain. And sure enough, we, dis- we discovered that, uh, and contrary to what we'd found in every other brain system, uh, which was usually hyper-excitable, the, the, the part of the brain that processes uh, touch and sensation uh, actually uh, had too little excitation. It never would have, I mean, I never would have had that idea if I wouldn't have talked to the families, you know, it was more than almost five years ago. Since that first SYNGAP-1 symposium, more researchers are paying attention to this connection between SYNGAP-1 and abnormal sensory processing. People like Rumba hope this is just the first discovery in a growing body of research that got its start when parents and scientists join forces. So research moves very slowly. So Facebook networks amongst families can grow very fast. And unfortunately, research crawls at a snail's pace. It, I think it comes down to the fact that there, were, there was a, a group of parents that were savvy and that were motivated and took advantage of social media and reached out to researchers that were also um, you know, interested in, 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 in joining the network. This summer, the next Dirk 1A meetup will be held in Seattle, Washington, hosted by researcher Raphael Bernier and his colleagues. So far, 10 families are signed up to attend. More are expected to join as the summer approaches. Families will kind of get in on Friday the 21st, and then on Saturday the 22nd, the whole the day is set aside for uh, families to have have the meetup. And they've been doing this now um, uh, for several years, and it's super fun. And it's everyone, so everyone is involved in the day. So it's uh, it's it's parents, it's kids, and so everyone's it's it's kind of a, a good fun room full of mayhem. Along with the fun and the mayhem, there will be research. Research the scientists hope will uncover new insights into Dirk 1A that might one day lead to treatments. Bernier has his own hopes for the eventual outcome of these meetups. What I would love to do is be able to have some objective quantifiable marker that we could then, so we could, you know, get a good baseline assessment of what, what's going on with that biological marker, start an intervention, and see if it's, it's working. Tracking children over a time like this would be the only way to be certain that an intervention worked. It's a lofty goal, but one that the connections between researchers and families could facilitate. Other family groups, including one for ADNP syndrome, are already working with other scientists toward clinical trials. This has been an episode of Spectrum Stories, the podcast for Spectrum, the leading source for news and expert opinion on autism research. To read more about how families are driving autism research, check out Spectrum's deep dive called How Families Are Driving the Study of Autism Genes by Jessica Wright. Available now at spectrumnews.org. I'm Caitlin Swaljay.